So the solifugids, the camel spiders, are in the order solifugi. There's about 12, they're not about, there are 12 families right now. There's lots of different genera, plural of genus, and about 1,100 described species, with more being described every year. These animals are well adapted to xeric, uh, very dry, semi-dry desert environments. So they're found worldwide throughout all the deserts of the world, except, interestingly, Antarctica. So they have this interesting uh, distribution pattern. And they have probably more common names than any other arachnid that I know. These are just a few of the common names. So for example, in Arizona, they're called children of the earth because they seem to just appear out of nowhere and disappear at the same time. Uh, they're also called wind scorpions. Of course, we know now they're not scorpions. You all know this now. But they're called wind scorpions because they run like the wind. They're also called. Um, this one I'm not even going to try to pronounce, but in some parts of the world they're called this word, which means moving without purpose, again, because of their just erratic movement. Uh, they're called um, chasing spiders, yag spinacopa, in some parts of Africa, again, because they just run and run and run. In fact, I had a colleague named Yael Lubin who works in the Negev Desert in Israel, and Yael one time wanted, she, these things run all the time. You see them and they're just zipping across the landscape. So she wanted to follow one to see how long it could run without stopping. She followed the animal for an hour and it never stopped. They're amazing. They have bizarre metabolism. They have met metabol metabolic rate more like insects, this really high metabolic rate, which means that they're constantly eating and they're voracious feeders, voracious eaters. They're also called, I love this one, harskeeters, meaning hair cutters in South Africa, because there they believe that they crawl into your bed at night and clip your hair, kind of like the arachnid version of a bizarre barber. Um, and I have to admit, and I'm sort of ashamed to admit this, that I've created yet another, as if they weren't, they weren't uh, burdened by enough common names, I created yet another one, which is Spawn of Satan. <laughs> Because these things are, John said I had kind of a love-hate relationship with these. I love the research that I do, but my goodness, they are difficult to find, difficult to collect because they run so fast. They are very difficult to keep alive in the lab. In fact, early on in my research, before I learned better, I put one in a terrarium and it literally just ran around, ran around, ran around until it keeled over on its back and died, like it had a little heart attack. And they're impossible to rear from hatch through maturity. So it's not like you can, you can keep a lab culture of them going. Nobody has figured out how to raise them from, from hatch through maturity. So they're a really challenging group to work with, which means that the research that we have accomplished, I'm, I'm really proud of it, because it's taken a whole lot of work to get this research done. Uh, now, what I want to do now is dispel some of the myths that are out there. How many of you have seen this picture? Yeah, this has gone its rounds on the internet, and every few years it makes its rounds again. And people see this picture and think, oh, goodness, these things are this big. Well, of course, it's the angle of the photograph that makes them look that big. They're really only two to three inches. They, they are about the size of the sulfugids on my shirt. So this is life size for some of these species that are found in Iraq and Afghanistan. If you didn't notice the shirt, I wore it for you. It's <laughs> sulfugids. So in Iraq and Afghanistan, and some parts of the Middle East, you do find the largest species in the genus Galeotes. And they do get, I mean, big, two, three inches, but not two feet. Couple funny, funny stories to do with this photograph. One, um, I was down doing some research in Oklahoma at a military base, and I was talking to a young soldier who had just gotten back from deployment in, in Iraq. He found out I was an arachnologist, and he said, oh, he said, so do you know these camel spiders? And I said, well, <laughs> in fact, I do. And he said, well, you know, we saw them there. And he said, in Iraq, he said, they get two feet in size. And he said, and you know, they can jump up and they can grab the belly of a camel or a horse and drag it down. And then they burrow into its gut and then they lay their eggs inside. And I said, really? That's interesting. And he said, yeah, but all we ever saw were the babies. <laughs> so of course what he was seeing, he was seeing the adults. Um, I didn't dispel any of that for him. I did do dispel it for you, but uh, it was just too much fun. But the other funny story about this, this particular photograph is I was doing research with a, um, 
an assistant of mine, Aaron Spriggs, and we had been we had been on the road for a couple weeks, for a long time. We'd been camping at all the deserts in the Southwest and Arizona and New Mexico. It was a long, brutal trip. It was the middle of the summer. It was hot. We were on our way back in New Mexico, and I decided to treat us to, to rooms in a motel. So we pulled over at some podunk town in a podunk mom and pop motel, because I'm too cheap to stay in a you know, nicer motel. And I go in, and it's about 11 o'clock at night, so I go in, and there's a night manager there. And I said, uh, you know, we want a couple rooms. And he looked at our vehicle, and he said, you've got government plates. He said, uh, what, what government agency do you work with? And I said, oh, no, that's a museum vehicle. We just have government plates for our museum vehicle. And he said, oh, well, where do you work? And I said, well, Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And he said, oh, really? What do you do there? And I said, uh, I'm, I'm a biologist on staff. And, and he said, oh, that's interesting. Well, what do you study? And I always hesitate to say I study arachnids, because you can imagine you should come to my house, because I've got arachnids in the basement. It's all, all things that people say to me. But, but I, he forced me, he said, well, I figured you were a biologist. What do you study? And I said, oh, I study arachnids. And he said, oh, he said, like camel spiders. And I said, you know, we have been traveling for two weeks, and you are the only person who knows what camel spiders are. That's amazing. He said, oh, well, you know that picture on the internet with soldiers holding the two camel spiders? He refers to this picture. And whenever people bring this picture up, it's always to ask me, do they really get this big? And so I interrupted him and I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I know that picture, but they don't really get that big. I think it's probably the lens the photographer was using and maybe the angle of the photograph. And he said, no, 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 no. I took that picture. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, New Mexico really is the land of enchantment. <laughs> And it turned out the guy's name was John Chandler, and he'd been stationed there. He's an amateur photographer, and his buddies were playing around with two sulfugids. One bit the butt of the abdomen, not the butt, but the abdomen of the other one. And one of his buddies just, you know, reached down and grabbed the first one up, lifted it up, and John took a picture. And I thought, who, who would have imagined I didn't meet this the photographer of this picture? Another myth that you get, which I already referred to, talks about how they can bring down big mammals and burrow in the skin. And, uh, <laughs> and this is a movie that came out last year, which is a fantastically bad B movie. I highly recommend it. It's, <laughs> it's so bad. But it's so bad, it's good. And here we see this myth propagated about the sulfugids attacking and they're biting, they're burrowing into his ear and his mouth. And of course, they've totally got it wrong, right? Because they've got spider webs around it. They have, they're not, have nothing to do with spiders. They're a whole different order. And in some parts of the world, it's actually believed that they are highly, highly venomous. So there are many places in Africa where they fear sulfugids more than they fear the local snakes, which really are venomous. They truly believe that these things can kill you. They have, there's no species that has venom glands, so none of them are venomous. The worst even the bigger ones can do is give you, give, break your skin and give you a little cut or, or a bite. But the ones that we have here, and oh yes, we do have them here. Here in Colorado, we have them out on the plains, and they're so small, they're only about an inch or so in size, and they probably can't even, well, I know they can't even break your skin because they've tried to bite me. <laughs> so, hopefully I've dispelled some of the myths that are out there. Now what I'm going to do is introduce you to some of the research that we've done. So as John mentioned, for the last, pretty much since I got here, I've been doing research, my lab has been doing research on these animals. And I already sort of introduced you to their body parts. I didn't mention their eyes. They do have two distinct eyes on the top of their head region, their cephalothorax. We don't think that they have very good eyesight. Probably they, they perceive light dark, shadows, but that's about it. So most of what they're doing appears to be via sensory hair-like structures that are covering their pedipalps. So what we've done in our lab is try to fill in gaps in our understanding and our knowledge of this group. We really know very little about the biology of the sulfugids of these camel spiders. So that's the whole purpose, is to try to do, take all sorts of avenues at, to really better understand their biology. I mentioned there are 12 families, so this is a table listing the 12 families. Here in North America, there are only two of these families. In North America, which is called the Nearctic region, we have the Amortrechidae and we have the Arimabatidae. I mentioned already there's over 1,100 species. The, this is the family, oops, the Arimabatidae 
is the family that my lab focuses on. And the reason that um, I first got into this, the study of camel spiders is because of Jack Brookhart. So Jack is one of my research associates in the department. And Jack, as this, paper, as this uh, cutting from a newspaper indicates, has been doing research on these things since the 1960s. He is one of the world's, he is the world expert on sulfugates. He got his master's degree. He's a retired teacher, so he used to drag his students out to collect sulfugids. And he um, got his master's degree with, a, with an arachnologist named Martin Muma, who has since passed away. But since the 1960s, when he started his research, he's been continually publishing and working on this thing, these animals. When I first got to the museum in 1998, Jack found out I was here, or I found out he was here, one or the other, but we found out that there were two arachnologists in town, which is sort of unusual. So we got in touch, and Jack came in, and he's a very, very polite, gentle person. And he, before I even knew it, I was doing research on the spawn of Satan. Didn't know what happened, but it was because Jack pulled me into the research. So he's a co-author or, or first author on most of the publications we've been doing. So the major goals of the research that's going on in my lab, these are, these are the major things that we have wanted to accomplish. And, and we got National Science Foundation funding back in 2007 to study these animals. So that was a five-year grant. And in the course of the grant, what we, the main thing that we wanted to do was to create and to, deter, to do the first phylogenetic analysis, meaning an evolutionary analysis that would demonstrate how the different genera and the different species within the family of Remabatidae were related to one another. And we would do that using both molecular data and morphological data, molecular being DNA sequence data. We also were going to use this backbone phylogeny, this evolutionary tree, to then revise the taxonomy, how the different species were organized of the Arimabatids. And then on the way, we wanted to just figure out as much about their biology as we could. So look at their morphology, the anatom weird anatomy that they have, and the behaviors that they have. What I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to show you this fresh off the press uh, phylogeny that we've done using the molecular DNA data. And then I'll go over some of the morphological research we've done as well as some of the behavioral stuff. But in order to study these animals, we had to do field work. So we had to go out to the deserts of, of the United States, to all the deserts, the Sonoran Desert, the Mojave Desert, the Chihuahuan Desert, the Great Basin Desert and collect these animals. We needed fresh specimens. As we use museum specimens, but we also needed fresh specimens to do the DNA analysis. So we went out to these gorgeous habitats. Unfortunately, we had to visit the desert habitats when the animals were most active, which was usually between June and August, which meant we were out there when it was anywhere between in the high 90s to 120 degrees. So it was kind of challenging field work. And we used two different primary collecting techniques to find these animals. One, we used light trapping. We set lights up in the desert, or if we were at a campground, we trap lined the existing lights, the lights that were, were on the camp, campground bathrooms and such. Because it turns out that lights attract, we know, insects. You turn your porch light on, you get a swarm of moths and things coming. But after the insects start coming to the lights, the predators start coming to the lights. So the sulfugids are attracted to the lights as well. Now, are they attracted to the lights? Or are they attracted to the vibrations and the smells of the insect? We don't know. But what we do know is that lights are an effective way to, to collect the sulfugids and to find them. The other technique we used is pitfall trapping, where we put Tupperware containers about so, so wide with, filled with preservative. We use propylene glycol, which is a preservative you find in foods, actually, but it also works very well to preserve animal tissues. And we set up a pitfall trap array, which looks like this. We used landscape fencing, plastic fencing. And in the middle of the three arms of fencing, we put one of our pitfall traps. It's covered with a, with a wooden lid to keep the rain out. At the ends of each arm, we put another pitfall trap. And on the, on the, uh, in the middle of each arm, on either side, we put two more pitfall traps. So each array had 10 cups, 10 pitfall traps. And we set a whole bunch of these arrays out there. And the whole idea is that if an arthropod, if an insect or an arachnid is running through the desert, 
would hit one of these one of these fences, and they just take the path of least resistance. They're not going to bother to expend the energy to go over the fence. They're just going to probably run along it until they topple into one of our cups. Very effective way to get maximum amount of, of collecting done. We leave these out in the desert for four weeks or so, and then go revisit them, change the, the, the pitfall cups, pull out the specimens and then recharge them so that we can get the, the species that are active in that desert environment throughout the summer, throughout the season. So those are the two methods that we use to collect these animals. And this gives you an idea of the amount of ground that we covered. So we collected everywhere, everywhere there's a desert environment in the western United States, that's where we visited to collect these animals. What this shows you is the existing taxonomy, our existing knowledge of, of how these different genera, uh, plural of genus, are organized within the family of Remabatidae. So we have our family, family of Remabatidae, is divided into two subfamilies, the subfamily of Remabatinae, subfamily Therobatinae. Within the Arimabatini, it's divided into five different genera, Arimabates, Arimacosta, Arimarax, Arimathera, and Horobates. Beautiful names, I think. And then the subfamily Therobatini has three genera, Chambria, Arimachilis, and Hemerotreca. The three large gen genera, Arimabates, Arimachilis, and Hemerotreca, are subdivided into different species groups. And in parentheses, it shows you how many species are in the family divided into these different genera and these different taxonomic categories. So when we're doing a phylogenetic analysis, you can think of it as hypothesis testing, because what we're doing is, first of all, we wanted to test the hypothesis that the two subfamilies are real biological entities. In other words, if the subfamily of Remabatini, if the, all, the genera, oops, all the genera within the subfamily of Remabatini are related to one another, then, then on our evolutionary tree, they should all be coming out on the same branch. That's one way to think about it. Same thing with the other subfamily. If Chambria, Remachilis, and Hemerotreca are really all related to one another, they should all be coming out on the same branch. Same thing with the genera. Right? For each genus, if a Remacosta is a, is a good genus, then all the species that are in that genus should be coming out closely related on our evolutionary tree. Same thing for all the other genera that are in the family. And then we also tested the hypothesis that all these different species groups are real biological entities, are what we call monophyletic groups. So what I'm showing you next, oops, and this gives you an idea in red, of how many species within each taxonomic category we managed to collect when we were doing all this field work. You don't need to look at all the red numbers because what it means is that we got 81 fresh samples that represented all eight genera. And we got 14 of the, the 18 species groups that were in, within the family. So we got a really excellent representation of the entire diversity that's present within the family of Remabatidae. And this is our fresh off the press phylogeny. So I'm just going to walk you through it and I'll show you some slides that, that highlight what are the take home messages. One take home message is that the family itself is monophyletic. So the Arima Batidae, this family, we use uh, taxa outside the Arima Batids. We use taxa that were from uh, three of the other families, three of the other 12 families. And those three outgroup tax are coming out really distantly related to all the Arima Batids. So all the Arima Batids, they're all related. They're all coming out from this branch. So that's a good thing. Now let's look at our subfamilies. I said that's another hypothesis we were testing. Well, the Arima Batini, and it's, it's kind of off the, the name should be right there. <clears throat> but these are all of those five genera that were in the subfamily Arima Batini. And all of them, except for this one oddball, Horobates, they're all coming out on this branch. That's great. That means Arima Batini, except for this Horobates, we've got to change the placement of this one because it's clearly not, doesn't belong in the Arima Batini. But everything else does, so that's great. That's a real biological entity. It's a monophyletic group. Therobatini, not so much. So the, different, the three genera, Chambria, Remachilis, and Hemerotreca, that, are in, that are represent, currently represent the therobatini, that other subfamily, they're all over the place. So that is an artificial group. And when we reassess the taxonomy, we are going to bury that subfamily because it doesn't, biologically it doesn't exist according to this. 
And then the genera, I'm, not gonna, I'm just going to highlight a few where you can see that they're monophyletic. So for example, the Arimarax, that's great, isn't it? Because they're all coming out on one branch. Arimacosta, all coming out on one branch. Oh, except for this one. And Jack has since looked at this one and decided that the person who originally described the species in place in Arimacosta made a mistake because it does not have the morphological features that everybody else does in that genus. So this is a really fantastic way, this kind of phylogenetic analysis, to really go back into the taxonomy and, and really think about whether the names are correct, whether the groups are correct groups, correct being real biological entities. Some of the other genera, they're kind of all over the place and we're going to have to rethink them. But several of the genera are good groups, like Chambria, Arima Costa, Arima Rax. Arima Bates is a really big group and it probably need, we probably need to create other genera to, to group maybe this, this grouping right here and this grouping. So we need to kind of march through it and reassess the taxonomy. But it's exciting. And then the species groups, are, there were only a few species groups that were, that were monophyletic. So we're going to have to go back through and reassess some of the species groups. But what's great about this is that we now have a backbone phylogeny, a backbone evolutionary tree that we can use to start asking all sorts of other questions about these animals. And what we found is that the subfamily Arima batani seems to be monophyletic, seems to be a good group, not the therobatany, they're all over the place. The following genera are good, they seem to be good biological entities, and these genera we need to reassess. So that's, that's fantastic. And this paper, and I won't march through the rest of those, but this uh, paper is in review right now. So we've written it up and we're waiting to revise, we're revising it to send it back to the journal. So it's very close to publication. Now the next few studies that I want to talk about have to do with the morphology, the anatomy of these animals, because they're bizarre. I mean, they, everybody thinks they're bizarre. I think they're bizarre. I study them and I think they're bizarre is they have all these strange characteristics on their body. One that you may have noticed are these little fleshy things that, that are underneath their body. And a researcher years ago figured out that those were chemoreceptors. Those, those were organs that they have on the underside of the body that are picking up chemical cues as they're walking through the desert. Pretty cool. So we didn't have to look at those because somebody had already figured those out. But there are all sorts of characters that are associated with these pedipalps that we wanted to explore. And here's a uh, scanning electron micrograph, a photograph of an uh, up close version of the pedipalp. So we wanted to pick apart their morphology. And one of the features that we really wanted to, to understand better is something called the suctoral organ. And the suctoral organ, as it su su the name suggests, allows them to suck onto surfaces. So the suctoral organ, this is a SEM, a scanning electron micrograph or photograph of the very tip of a pedipalp of a sulfugid. And this balloon-like thing that's popped out of the tip of the pedipalp is the suctoral organ. And it turns out that they can pop it out or pull it back in. And it looks like a little balloon thing that's popping out or, or being pulled back in. And people have known about this organ for many, many years, ever since people started doing research on these animals. And what they knew about them is that the suctoral organ allowed these animals to be like mini Houdinis. If you collected one and put it in a glass jar and didn't put a lid on it, you didn't have a sulfugid in there because they would literally use those suctoral organs to climb up and out that gl smooth glass jar. And they were used, they seemed to be using and, and using primarily the suctoral organs, not hooks on their feet or anything else, on their tarsi or anything else. So we wanted to explore the, the, the morphology of this organ. So we used different techniques. One technique we used was scanning electron mi microscope technique, where we took very highly magnified images of these suctoral organs. So this is a suctoral organ that's everted, that's popped out. And you can see that the surface is ridged, a ridged surface. So there's a lot of surface texture there, a lot of surface area there. And we think that the way that they form these, they basically are forming hydrophilic bonds to the smooth surfaces that are in nature. Probably aren't glass jars in nature, but what they're probably doing, what a, um, subsequent to the paper we published, 
another colleague published a behavioral paper that demonstrated that they use these suctor organs to hold on to the smooth exoskeleton of their insect prey and pull it towards them. And they do that by forming a hydrophilic bond, a bond with the water that's on smooth surfaces. If you know how geckos walk up smooth surfaces, it's the same concept, exactly the same concept. So what I'm going to show you is how they use these to crawl up a smooth surface. And what I want you to pay attention to is watch the pedipalps. So it's using exclusively the tips of the pedipalps to climb up that surface. It's not using the legs at all. The next image is you can clearly see the suctor organ. So in this first image, the animal has the suctoral organ, that white little uh, balloon-like thing. It's everted. It's held onto the glass already. And what you're going to see is the animal is going to pull it in. And as it pulls the suctoral organ in, it releases its hold on the glass. And it's doing that as it's already lifted the other, the other pedipalp up and everted the other suctoral organ. And the legs are just flailing around. They're not, they're not functioning much at all. What we also did is we used his histological techniques. We took uh, fine cross sections uh, longitudinally through the pedipalp and hor horizontally through the pe pedipalp, cross sections through the pedipalp, to look at that structure. And we also, again, used these SEM techniques. And what we found is that when they pull it back in, it folds up like an accordion which is what you see up here. This is a suctor organ that's all folded up before it's pulled in. When it's completely pulled in, these cuticular um, plates cover it up. And then when it everts it, the cuticular plates open and it pops out. So how does it do that popping and inversion and inversion? Well, it uses muscle bands. By doing this dissection, we were able to see that it has muscle bands attached to the inside of the suctor organ. So it uses energy to pull those things into the pedipalp to invert it. And then to evert it, it just increases the hemolymph for blood pressure. And that's how it pops it out. So it pulls it in with muscles and pushes it out with an increase in hemolymph pressure. So we were able to publish this paper in, a, in another journal, Arthropod Structure and Development, several years ago. Another cool thing that we did now, I mentioned at the beginning that the pedipalps, you can see them here, are covered in hairs, covered in these sensory seedy. So we wanted to find out something about the structure of these seedy. Now under light microscope, you just see that they're hairs, but you don't see the substructure, the real microscopic structure of each individual hair. So what a gra an undergraduate student at the time, Patrick Casto and I did, is we used, again, SEM te technology to survey the pedipalps of one representative of each of the 12 families, just to see what the hairs were like under that kind of magnification. What we were asking, what we really wanted to get at are, were there hairs, sensory structures, that we found across the order in all 12 families? And were there hairs, alternately, that we only saw in one representative or in two representatives? Because that might give us some indication about how the families are related to one another. So for example, this is a plate of some of these gorgeous hairs that we saw. These bifurcated hairs we saw across the board. Every family had these bifurcated hairs. So they were common to all the families. Some of them, like this crazy thing with these finger-like tips, no idea what the function is, but we saw that in only one representative of the 12 animals that we looked at. And in some of the hairs, we were able to guess at function. So some of these hairs, we saw apical pores. We saw pores, openings, at the very tip of the hair, like right here, and right here, here's an opening, a pore. And right here, there are two pores. Now, when you see pores, that usually suggests that they're picking something up from the environment. Usually, it's chemicals that they're picking up. So it's either a structure that's used for smelling or for tasting. So we were able to guess that these, this one, this one, and this one, might be useful in chemoreception and picking up chemical cues or in olfaction. But usually when you see such few pores, one or just two pores at the tip, it's usually for chemoreception, picking up airborne odors. 
And this is another hair that we saw across the board. So this was a nice little paper. It's just a survey of the different CD that we saw across the order. But that one was also uh, published. So we've managed to get a lot of information out there to the scientific community. The next study we wanted to do also had to do with structures on the pedipalps. And they were these crazy hairs that look like little Christmas trees that we call papillae. And it turns out that these papillae are found only on the underside of the pedipalps of males, not of females, just of males, and only in three families, in the Arimabatidae, Carchiidae, and Sulpugidae. Only those three families did we find this field of these tree-like structures. So one thing we wanted to find out was, OK, do they all look the same? So if you look at a papillae uh, in Arimabatids, do they look the same as the papillae you see on the males in Carchiids? Do they look the same? And does that look the same as the ones that we see in the third family of Sulpugids? And we were able to answer that with a definitive no. So all of the species we looked at within the Arimabatidae that had these papillae, all those Arimabatid species, the papillae all looked like these little mini Christmas trees. In fact, one of the um, technicians, one, or one of the scientists I collaborated with to do this SEM over at the School of Mines, he was so impressed with this, he used it for his Christmas card that year. <laughs> Would have been even better if he'd hung little artificial balls on it anyway, little red and green. All the uh, species that we looked at within the Sulpugidae, all of those papillae look like this. Very different than what we saw in this family. They were uh, long, thin trunks with little spiculate branches. And the Carchiidae, a third pattern. So the families within a family looks very much very similar, between families very different. So what is, what is their function? We, that was what we, what the other thing that we wanted to find out about. Because the hypotheses, could be that they were mechanoreceptors. They were, mechanoreceptors are hairs, uh, hair-like CD that when they bend, when they move, they trigger a nerve response. So the animal knows when its limbs are moving or when that hair is moving. So that's a mechanoreceptor. A contact chemoreceptor is something that usually has a pore at the tip, like I just showed you, and is picking up chemical cues in the environment. Olfactory receptor is the animal's nose. It usually olfactory receptors and arthropods are hairs that have lots and lots of openings and are picking up lots of chemical cues that they're picking up from, from, the, from the air. And then secretory organ, as you might expect, would have none of the pores, but would, or actually it would have pores, but it would have a gland at the base, a gland that would secrete some sort of chemical that it, they spew out into the environment. But it wouldn't necessarily have a nerve that goes up. It just has the secretory organ in some way to get that secretion out to the environment. So those were our hypotheses. And we know enough in the arthropod literature to know what kinds of structures, microstructures, to expect to see if, they, if the papillae fit one or the other of these hypotheses. So for example, if it was a mechanoreceptor, what we would expect, and this is a, a longitudinal section through a hair, through an arthropod mechanoreceptor. So here's the shaft of the hair here, and here's the base of it. Here's where it fits into the, the limb, the antennae, or the pedipalp, or the leg, or whatever. And with mechanoreceptors, you don't see a nerve that goes up through the structure. You just see a nerve ending at the base. Because it's not picking up chemical cues, it's got no pores opening to the environment. It just has a dendrite, a nerve, that ends at the base so that if it bends, it triggers a, a nerve response and the animal knows that something's moving. If it is a chemoreceptor, arthropod chemoreceptors, we would expect to see an apical pore, an opening that lets the chemicals in. And with arthropod chemoreceptors, they almost always have a dendrite that extends all the way through the shaft of the hair. So they have a dendrite or nerve that runs all the way through the shaft and a pore at the very tip of the shaft. And a lot of arthropod chemoreceptors are also mechanoreceptors. They also serve this mechanoreceptor function and have another nerve that ends at the base of the, of the hair. And if it's an olfactory receptor in arthropods, they have lots of pores. All these little dimples or openings in this hair shaft. And you can see the canals that lead into that hair shaft. And they also have dendrites or nerves that run up through the, the hair. 
And if it's a secretory organ, if it's secreting some chemical, then it should have a gland at the base of the hair and some way to get that, that signal, that stuff, out into the environment. So we used different techniques to try to get at the function. One of them was used, uh, I worked with a colleague down in Oklahoma, Doug Gaffin, and we did an electrophysiology experiment where we took an itty bitty, teeny tiny little, I mean micro probe, a little micro electrode, and put that electrode into the base of a single papillae. And then we exposed that papillae to a variety of different stimuli. So one of the things we did was we physically bent it. We used a little capillary tube and we just pushed it. And the, elect the electrode was able to determine whether that triggered a, a signal, a, a nerve signal. We also exposed the papillae to water vapor to see if it might be a hygro receptor, picking up water in the environment, or water vapor detecting the amount of water that is uh, in the environment. Because these are desert animals, so that might be important. We also exposed it to a heated probe to see if it was a thermoreceptor, if it was picking up heat differences. Also might be important for a desert animal. And then we used whatever chemicals Doug had in his lab, and we exposed it to a whole variety of different kinds of chemicals. And all of this, we, we uh, tried to determine whether we were picking up any electrical signals. The other technique we used was TEM. Don't read all this, it's not important. But this is the TEM, transmission electron microscope. And transmissional, scanning electron microscopes take a, a highly magnified view of the surface of a structure. With TEM techniques, you use a diamond knife to make micro thin uh, uh, cuts through a structure that are thou one, one thousandth or less of a millimeter in, in width. I mean, teeny, tiny, very thin sections through a structure. And you can do longitudinal sections or, or horizontal cross sections. And then you use the TEM to look at the microstructures. The, what we were looking for is dendrites. So we wanted, we know that with these arthropod chemo receptors or olfactory receptors, we would expect to see dendrites going through the shaft. So that's what we were looking for with the TEM technique. So here are our results. With the, with the uh, electrophysiology experiment, the only response that, that was triggered was when we pushed the papillae. So these black bands, these signals, these sudden nerve signals that we were picking up corresponded exactly with when we pushed, we gently pushed the papillae. So we knew from this that it was a mechanoreceptor, but we got no signaling, no responses when it was exposed to water vapor, uh, heated probe, or to any of the chemicals that we exposed it to. So we weren't sure, with, with this technique, we were sure that it was a mechanoreceptor. This gave us good evidence that it was a mechanoreceptor, but not such good evidence that, that supported our hypotheses that it was a, some kind of chemo or olfactory receptor. So then we did these, this TEM technique where we did cross sections, and when we did that, then we saw the dendrites. So this may not be exciting to you, but it was exciting to us. So this is a, this is a longitudinal section through one of these papillae. So here are those little branches, it was a little Christmas tree structure. Here are the little branches, and this thing right here, that's a dendrite that's extending all the way up through the center of the shaft of the, of the structure of the papillae. And here it is again, here's the dendrite. We just couldn't get enough pictures of this, honestly. Just one picture after another of this dendrite. And then in the cross section, so this is a cross section near the base of the papillae. So if my arm is the Christmas tree, and this is where it, where it uh, embeds into the, the pedipalp, we did this cross section right here. And what did we see when we did that? But outside, here's the shaft of the CD, and outside the shaft, we saw these structures magnified here. And we know from the literature that these are tubular bodies which are indicative of a mechanoreceptive dendrite that ends at the base. So we have good evidence from the TEM work that it does have a dendrite that extends up, that it has a dendrite that ends at the very base of the shaft, so it's a mechanoreceptor, and we also have evidence from electrophysiology it's a mechanoreceptor. And then here are dendrites that we see in the middle of the, of the shaft. So with the cross sections and longitudinal sections, we see the dendrites. So this is good evidence that it might in fact be an olfactory receptor or a chemoreceptor, but what are we missing? We're missing the pores, some openings to the outside. 
And finally, after looking for hours at our SEM, we finally saw one or two that suggested openings. These are, this is a very highly magnified view of one of those branches. And when we looked at it carefully, we see a pore here, a pore here, and those are, the, those are the two main pores that we were able to see. So there do seem to be pore openings on the branches themselves. So this is what we think the structure looks like. We think it has a nerve that goes all the way up through the shaft. It has this mechanoreceptive nerve at the base, and then it has these pore openings on the branches. Now, why it didn't respond with the electrophysiology to the chemicals is maybe we just weren't using the right chemicals. So what we would love to do is to expose it to chemicals we extract from a female, because they're only found on the males. An archaeologist once said, I'll just go off on a tangent because I'm famous for that, but I was visiting a site in Israel once, and this archaeologist was showing us the site, and I saw this one structure, and I said, huh, I said, that's interesting. I said, what's the function of that? And he said, I don't know, probably a ritual of some sort. And then he paused, and he said, you know, when archaeologists see a structure and they don't know what it's for, they say it's for a ritual. When biologists see a structure and they don't know what it's for, they say it's for courtship and copulation. <laughs> and I thought, oh, he's so right. <laughs> So maybe we weren't exposing it to the right chemicals. Maybe what it responds to is just the sex pheromones of the female. We don't know. But we got enough data that we were able to publish that paper as well. So this is just the summary of what I, what I just went over. I'm going to skip over that because, and that was that publication, I'm towards the end and I just want to cover these two behavioral studies that we did. Um, I was out in the field in California with one of my undergraduate students, with Kyle Conrad. And I look over at him at one point, and he's got his, his butt in the air and his face right at the ground. And I thought, what is he doing? And I walked over, and I said, Kyle, what are you doing? He said, look. He said, look, there's all these baby sulfugids hunting. And so we watched, and I realized nobody's really published on juvenile hunting behavior. So we serendipitously made these observations in the field because we came upon them and we recorded their behavior, just what we saw, and it led to this little publication in the Journal of Arachnology, because we saw this cool behavior with the juveniles. With the adults, they, they're out there with their palps waving in the air, and then they rush at an insect, and they gobble it up, they tear it apart, but the juveniles, what we saw is they would, they would run around on this, on this um, what do you call it, sand? <laughs> Complicated term. I got mechanoreceptive down, but sand is a little difficult for me. But they run around on the sand, and then all of a sudden they stop, and then they dig, and then they pull from the sand grains an aphid or a little soil arthropod. So we don't know how they're doing that. It might be that they're using chemical cues they're picking up from those fleshy things underneath and they're, they're detecting these insects that are in amongst the sand grains. But we were able to record some of these interesting behaviors we saw with the juveniles. The last thing I'm gonna leave you with, because it's always great to leave you with a sex video, isn't it? <laughs> so so the, these things, one of the students who I worked with, Jen Rousell, just finished her master's degree. She did this work down at Texas, and I worked closely with Jen. But she decided she was more interested in their behavior. She loves sulfugids, God knows why. She loves sulfugids, and she wanted to look at their behavior. So she specifically wanted to look at their courtship, their copulation, they don't really have courtship, but their copulation, copulatory behavior. And so she collected as many males and females of one species as she could, of multiple species, but she ended up with a really great data set about 20 pairings for one species of Arima batted. And she was able to film all of these matings and basically create an, etho an ethogram of documentation of the behaviors that are involved when they mate with each other. And mating in these things is bizarre. I'm an arachnologist. There's a lot of bizarre things in arachnids, but this is really bizarre. And you're going to see a film of it in just a second. But when they mate, I'm going to just tell you what you're going to see. Because when they mate, the male, detects the female, we don't know how, he rushes at her, he grabs her with his huge telissery, his jaws, he grabs her around the middle, and as soon as he makes contact with her, she immediately becomes quiescent. She immediately stops moving. It's almost like she goes into an immediate trance state. We have absolutely no idea what triggers that. But she goes into a trance state and she bends her body 
almost at right angles. Then the male, ladies, get ready. It's, it's bizarre. He sticks his chelicery all the way into her gonopore and starts chewing on her. And he chews and he chews and he chews. And she's completely entranced. She's just totally still. And then he will suddenly pull his chelicery. And he's just using the top part of his jaws. He pulls those out. And then he moves his body up. And he deposits from his genital opening on his abdomen, he deposits a sperm packet right on her opening. Then he bops back down and then sticks his chelicery back into her and chews again. We don't know what's going on with the first chewing, but the second chewing, more than likely, he's pushing that sperm packet into her and then chewing to open it up and to release the sperm. And that's what you're going to see in the video that I leave you with. So in the video, Jen had this really brilliant idea of setting up the animals in a mirrored terrarium. <laughs> I'll just let you think about that. <laughs> but the idea was that she could see everything that was going on all, all around the animals, beneath, mostly beneath the animals. So if it looks like there are two animals there, there's really just one. That's the female. And when I start this, I'll walk you through it, but what you're going to see is all of a sudden from out of, the, out of view, the male is going to rush at her and grab her. So she's moving around, moving around, excited to get out of the terrarium. And this mirrored surface, I just thought that was a brilliant idea, it's a really great setup. Jen, this manuscript, and there he is, he's just rushed at her. Um, he's grabbed her and watch her immediately in, in a trance. She's totally stopped moving. Jaws have stopped moving. Palps have stopped moving. He's got his chelicery right in her and is chewing. And watch his petty palps. That, the other cool thing that Jen was able to discover is that he uses those suctor organs to manipulate her. So he's holding on to her with those suctor organs. So he's chewing, chewing, chewing. This goes on for quite a while. All the women are like, ooh. <laughs> that looks uncomfortable. And he's only using the top jaw. One of the ways you can sex and, and figure out the gender of, of Arima Badids is that females have teeth on both the upper jaw and the lower jaw. The males have no teeth on the upper jaw. And male sulfugids across the board for all 12 families have these structures called flagella or in this family, flagellar complex, these specialized CD or specialized structures that are associated with the upper jaw. And we have no idea what the function of the flagellum is. Any minute now, you're going to see him release her or pull his, his chelicery out and move his body up to deposit the sperm packet. But look at the, the use of the pedipalps, too. Because one of our hypotheses about those papillae was that he might be, there he goes, he's just deposited the sperm packet. And now he's going to chew on her again, push it in. He's going to, and as he chews on her, she's eventually, in about a minute, she's going to start moving and wriggling and trying to get away. But right now, she's still in this trance. So we think that the papillae might be picking up chemical cues. There she is. She's, she's getting a little bit active. Might be picking up chemical cues from her body. So now she's trying, she's struggling. She's woken up. You can see her palps moving. You'll see her jaws start moving. And now she's just trying to get away from him. I know it's a shock, but a lot of times you'll see sexual cannibalism in sulfugents. It's not really a shock to me. That's what I would expect of them. In this case, Jen, Jen rarely saw sexual cannibalism. But, but on the other hand, she didn't let it happen because it was uh, these were precious specimens to her, especially the females. She collected, she had to reuse some of the females in some of these tests. So the female's just trying to get away at this point. And he's, ultimately, he's going to release her, and then they're just going to So this is a great piece of work. And there we go. Now, now they're running away from each other. Uh, Jen has this manuscript in prep and is about to submit it. 
So that's it. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. And we have, we have a few minutes for questions. So if you've got questions. Yes. Um, so you were talking about the propeller. Do you ever think that like a different propeller on like it's a specific spider itself, like not spider, but you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, so like this one would be like for feeling, and then this one over here would be for like so the question was whether we thought that with these, this field of papillae that one papillae might be for one function and another papillae might be for another function. It could be, but it's doubtful because they, they, with the SEM, we were able to determine that they look exactly the same. So because su superficially on the outside they look exactly the same, chances are that they have the same, that whole field has the same function. And we see that with um, structures on scorpion bodies. We see that with those funny structures on the underside of the, of the sulfuges that are called malleoli. They all function the same way, so they're not taking different functions. Yes. Oh, great questions. What do they eat and are they cannibalistic? Um, yes, they are cannibalistic, so they'll eat each other for sure if they're hungry. And they'll eat anything they want to. So they'll eat anything from slightly smaller than themselves to slightly larger than themselves. And, and we don't know how they're, like, what, what, what I've begun to think is that when they come to these lights um, to hunt, I think maybe they're picking up vibrations of the insects. Or one of my colleagues just found out that under certain wavelengths of UV light, uh, they actually fluoresce like scorpions do. And so there might be some kind of signaling there that has to do with hunting. But they'll eat anything that they can get a hold of. Yes, ma'am. Are they nocturnal and do they make nests? Are they nocturnal and do they make nests? They are nocturnal. So all, the majority of them are active from dusk through night. So when we were doing this field work, we would set up our lights right before dusk, and then we would be out there collecting at the lights uh, until 2 or 3 in the morning. And that and same time period that Jen was out, and the, everybody, that's, that's when they're, they seem to be most active from about 11 until 1. That's the peak of activity. There is one group that seems to be day active, one group in the genus Hemerotreca, but the rest of them are night active. And what was your second question? Do they make nests? Do they make nests? They make burrows. And the females will dig a burrow, and they will lay their eggs in the burrow. But... Uh, when we think of burrows, at least when I think of like spider burrows or other burrows, I think of a distinct opening on the top. What I've seen in the lab with these animals is that they'll dig a little burrow and then they cover it with soil. And you can't see that burrow. So we have no idea. When we're out in the field, we, it's not like we can go around and look for the burrows because there's no surface indication that it's there. But they don't make nests per se. Oh, that's a good question. If, if that's a good question. Uh, whether that, that picture with the soldiers holding the sulfugids, whether that was a male attacking a female. Honestly, that's bad of me. I haven't looked that closely. I should be able to figure that out. It could be. It certainly could be that it's a male and a female. Just, just looking at it briefly, it looks like they're the same. Usually the females have a fatter abdomen. So usually, and I didn't notice that in that picture, but I'll have to look at it again to see. Oh, that's a very good question. Do I have any knowledge of threatened or endangered camel spiders? Not per se, because they're such an understudied group. It's essentially our lab that's doing research on this, on this group, pretty much. There's a few papers that come out. In fact, today I just went to Google Scholar and looked for the papers that came out since 2011. And there's scattered papers from labs all around the world um, of descriptions of this species or documentation of the sulfugids that exist in this area but no lab that's consistently doing a lot of research on the group. So we don't know enough about their diversity, about the species that are found in different regions, or even about their habitat requirements to get at that question whether some of them might be endangered, threatened, or have already been driven to extinction. What I think, because we did a lot of uh, work 
basically when we were doing the field work, we were targeting areas where the type specimens were found, where the, the uh, specimen was collected that, that was used to describe a species. And a lot of these type localities were in California, co collected in the 1940s through the 1960s. And when we revisited those habitats, it was wall-to-wall -wall asphalt. And we, you know, we didn't see anything. And so I think in some parts of the desert uh, habitats where they live, there's been so much habitat degradation and, and changes that I bet some species have been driven to extinction. Uh, let me get this question. Oh, that's a good question. Do camel spiders use their burrows like trapdoor spiders to catch their food? As far as we know, they don't. So they're, they're not staying in the burrow except to hide during the day. Um, and then they come out at night and they're on the surface hunting. So I don't think they're using the burrow for anything except hiding. One thing I forgot to mention is that you get a lot of reports of soldiers in Iraq and Afghanistan who report that they've been chased by camel spiders. <laughs> And what's really happening most likely is that in doing the work that they're doing, they are disturbing the camel spiders out of their burrows. The camel spiders all of a sudden found in the middle of daylight, you know, exposed to daylight. They hate being in the sun and they are just seeking shade. Where's the shade? It's the shadow cast by the soldier. So as the soldier's moving, yeah, it looks like it's chasing you. It's really just trying to stay in the shadow of the soldier in the back. Oh, that's a good idea. Uh, if I ever considered ultrasounding the sand, we've considered all sorts of things. We've even considered radio tracking, like putting little tiny radio <laughs> collars on them to see if we could see where they go and if they consistently go back to the same burrow. I'd still love to do that. I haven't considered ultrasounds to see if we could see them. But I think it would be, it, you would spend hours and hours and hours and hours and maybe find nothing even if they're there. Because I think the, my feeling just from doing all the field work we did is that the populations are really, really scattered. They're not clustered like you see sometimes with tarantulas or other arachnids. Um, how do you know where their eggs and the traumatizing as the How do the females lay their eggs and is it as traumatizing as the mating? They, it's not traumatizing. So the females, their, their abdomen is, is full, filled with eggs. You can see the eggs through the cuticle oftentimes. And those might even be infertile eggs. So their ovaries will de start developing the eggs regardless of whether they're mated or not. More than likely fertilization occurs uh, as it occurs in most arachnids. As the egg is passing out of the body, they release sperm. So they probably have a way to store the sperm, but we're not sure of that. Um, and then they just lay a cluster of eggs. They're not covered with anything. They're not covered with silk. I've had them lay just a cluster of eggs in the sand. And sometimes those still hatch. And when the babies hatch, I think the, the mom, what we think, and we don't know a lot about that part of their reproduction, except just incidental reports from people who have them in the lab and have had the opportunity to watch that. What we think is that the female will guard the eggs until they start hatching and then she, her lifespan is over, she dies. The babies will hatch and they're completely helpless. They're little white uh, larval looking things. They have little chelicery but nothing is sclerotized, nothing is hardened. And so their whole body is white and soft and they just kind of stay clustered, hardly moving. Then they molt, so they're living off probably residual yolk from the egg stage they molt and they start to sclerotize, they start to harden up. And by about the second or third molt, they're old enough to start feeding. And at that point, that's when we lose them because they start cannibalizing each other. Um, some people have had luck feeding them with Kalimbala or other little tiny arthropods, but even that, we feed them for a while and then they all just disappear or die or get eaten by each other. Is it? Oh, good question. Do they what? Great question. Do they have parasites? We have no idea. It's never been reported in the literature, but I would be very surprised if they didn't have parasites. Yeah, because almost all other arachnids have been reported to be parasitized by wasps or worms or something.
could be whether the, the initial chewing might activate some, um, some secretion that might ha from the female that might have to do with hatching of the, or with the release of the sperm. It might, but I don't think so because the sperm's not there yet in that initial chewing. It could be, yeah, it could be. Um, what Jack thinks, Jack Brookhart thinks, is that he might be going in to remove sperm from a rival male, or he may be doing something kind of like you're getting at to prepare her for receipt of the sperm. But what that means, we don't know. Almost what you would almost have to do is to freeze them in the act. When he's got the chelicery in, sort of flash freeze them and then section them and see what's going on internally. Yes? Ah, good question. When they're mating, does the male sometimes kill the female? Sometimes the male kills the female. Sometimes the female kills the male. More often, it's the female that kills the male because she's a little bit larger than the, than the male. But it could go either way. And sexual cannibalism definitely happens in this group. Oh, they are DMS teen science scholars. So those are all teens who have worked with me through the teen science scholar program, which could consider next year. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, because there's preservative. They don't crawl out of the Tupperware because we have liquid. We have uh, liquid preservative in the bottom. No, propylene, uh, that's why we use propylene glycol is because it's viscous. And so if we, if we leave it out too long, it'll definitely evaporate in these temperatures. But if we only leave it out for like, you know, four weeks max, it's still, the, the uh, propylene glycol is still in there. So, other questions? Yes, Rick. Oh, that's a good question. Why they are desert specialists and haven't radiated? They actually have. So there are some species that are found in more mesic environments. So we have a species called Chinchip or in the genus Chinchipus, which is uh, I don't I don't it's not an it's not an Arima bata. It's in the Amertrechidae that's found in South America. That's in on beaches. So it's still a xeric environment, but it's beaches adjacent to a mesic forest. So. They do are sometimes reported from slightly wetter habitats, although I feel like even, even when you see them in those habitats, the microhabitat that they're really reliant on is still a dry habitat. The beach is still a dry habitat. So why they haven't radiated further than that, I don't, I mean, I don't know. It's a great question. Uh, to get at a question like that, you'd have to look at the higher level phylogeny. You'd have to do a phylogeny of all the families, which my colleague at, at the American Museum is supposed to be working on right now. But that would be, you'd kind of need that backbone evolutionary tree to start asking these broader questions about uh, diversity in the whole group of sulfugids in the whole order. Oh, my God. Oh, they do. And what, what's your elevation? That's, and I live in Golden, which is uh, you know, 5,600 feet or so. That's probably about the limit here in Colorado. We're not positive of that, though, because in California, they're, they're certainly found higher. I, I had a, one of my teens uh, who worked with me one year found them at about 9,000 feet in California. So I, I don't think it's an elevational thing. I think it's strictly a habitat. If the habitat is good, if it's xeric enough, if it's the right kind of habitat, they can extend up in elevation. But I think here in Colorado, when we move up, we get into more of a forested habitat, which they don't li tend to like. Have you considered coming up with a you know, have I considered coming up with a specimen-friendly pamphlet for the armed forces? That wouldn't be any fun. <laughs> the stories are too good. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Let me see. Is there another question here? Oh, it's great questions. Uh, what's their lifespan and what kind of predators prey on them? Their lifespan, we're not sure. We think probably about a year. Uh, we're not sure because we simply can't get them to live very long in the lab. In the lab, we've had 
them live for maybe three months, four months, but that's about max. Um, from hatch through maturity is probably about a year, but we're not sure. What would prey on them? Other sulfugids eat, they eat each other. Love your shirt, by the way. They eat each other. Um, they also are eaten by scorpions, so bigger predators. They've been found in the guts of birds. In fact, this, this species of chinchipus, uh, Jack and I were co-authors on that paper, and we described a new species that was originally collected from the gut of a bird. <laughs> so they are, they, birds certainly will eat them. Other larger predators would eat them. I imagine lizards would eat them. So this, anything that would eat arthropods would, would probably eat sulfugids. In the, So how much space do you give them when, in the lab, you mean, right? Oh, the territory. Gosh, only knows. I mean, this, this thing that Yael did where she was following one, I mean, it was ranging really far. So we have no idea how far they hunt. When I'm setting up these lights in the desert, uh, they're coming from really big distances to those lights. Now, whether they, that's just a super stimulus that they're attracted to, so that might be artificial, but I really think when they're out there hunting, they're, they're cruising around, and they're covering a lot of ground. And I think that probably also suggests that they don't have a permanent burrow. When, when sunlight, when uh, morning comes, they probably just dig in wherever they are. But we don't know what their territory, if they have a territorial range or a hunting range. Um, we don't know any of those answers. Yep, another great question. What's the population density? Absolutely no idea. Um, we know more now. When I first did a talk like this years ago, my answer to like 90% of the question was, no, nah, I don't know. No, nah, I don't know. And it's still, I don't know, for a lot of the, of the questions. But my feeling, just from the field work that I've done, is that there's a patchiness to the population. So what I've, what I've observed, and it, it's may just be anecdotal, is that I'll put my pitfall array on one ridge, and then I'll go to the next ridge and put another array. And to me, the habitat looks identical. Identical plants, identical soil, everything identical. And I'll get you know, 20 sulfugids in my, in my pitfalls on one ridge, nothing in the other one, which would suggest that there, there's some sort of cl population clustering that's going on. But that's, again, just anecdotal, and I really have no idea how big the populations get. Yes, we, I'll, I'll show you the name of my favorite new species. We've described lots of new species in, in the lab. My favorite one, I'll, I'll tell you the story, is one where the type specimen was collected years ago on the Nevada nuclear test site, where they originally tested the first <laughs> nuclear weapons. And it was in the genus Hemerotreca, so Jack and I named it Hemerotreca kabumi. <laughs> <laughs> in honor of the first nuclear test that went on there. And the, and the whole time we submitted this paper to the Journal of Arachnology, and the whole time we were like, oh, I hope the peer reviewers let that go. I hope they, I hope they approve. And we got the reviews back, and they wanted us to change a few things, but they didn't say anything about the names. We're like, yes, <laughs> Kabumi stands. <laughs> What's that? Battle between a rock and a hard place. Oh, that's, that's a great picture that was taken by Gail Starrs. Gail in the audience? I was just trying no. to make Oh, OK. No, no, no. It might actually. It's not, actually. My, but. my real question is, uh, why are they really known to be called camel spiders? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I was hoping nobody would ask that. Why are they called camel spiders? We have no idea. Might be because the shape of the body kind of looks like a camel. It doesn't look like a camel to me. It could be because of this myth that they can eat camels and attack camels. But we don't really know why they're called camel spiders. I did have, I meant to put in this picture that I found on the internet that had a camel body and a sulfugid face, which I thought was pretty funny. <laughs> uh, let's see, you and you and, do we have more? Jessica? Okay. Anybody who hasn't asked, otherwise I'll answer these two. Okay, yes, sir. Uh, 
Oh, so, so when they fall in a pitfall trap, do they sometimes eat other sulfugids that are in the trap so you don't get as many uh, samples as you might expect. They don't, but only because we have the preservative in them. If we didn't have the preservative, we wouldn't have any sulfugids, or we'd just have one big fat sulfugid. But mostly, <laughs> mostly we wouldn't have any because they'd be able to use the sector organs to crawl out. But when they topple in, they are struggling in that, in that really thick preservative that we have. So they're, ju they're just trying to get out and escape before they drown, but they, they ultimately drown. So I don't think there's any way that they can attack anything that's in there. But that's a good question. Yes? Oh, what a great, these, oh boy, great questions from this mini group of people up here. This is great. How fast can camel spiders run? Uh, incredibly fast. So they really do, they're, they're uh, called wind scorpions for a reason. So they run like the wind. And what I, the way that I collect them, because they are so fast, when you see them in the desert, at first I was afraid to pick them up because like I said, they can't do anything to you but they act like they're gonna go right for your jugular. So I was afraid to grab them. I'm not afraid anymore because I missed too many of them. I had a Tupperware container and I'd try to trap them and they would get away before I could trap them. So what I learned was from a collector in California uh, I, Wendell Eisenagel, who's on this list, and he was great at collecting. And I said, Wendell, how do you do it without losing them? He said, oh, well, I just have a, a squirt bottle. I said, what do you mean a squirt bottle? He said, yeah, I fill, I fill a squirt bottle with alcohol and I just shoot them. <laughs> I thought, <laughs> what a great idea. So, so one of my pieces of field equipment is, is the little spritz bottle that you use for ironing, and I fill it with ethanol and we just shoot them. <laughs> Because they run so fast. One more question? Did you have? Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. <laughs>